Hello everybody, my name is Grace DiLiberto. Welcome to our grievance hearing training. You should have a handout in your packet, basic skills for presenting your case at hearing. Before I begin, I'd like to give you a brief overview of the grievance process as a review for those of you who are familiar with the process and as a brief introduction for those of you who are not familiar with the process. But the grievance procedure begins with an employee filing a grievance with their supervisor on a grievance form A. The employee uh, receives a written response from his or her, her supervisor and can appeal that response through three progressively higher levels of management. If the grievance isn't resolved through the management or resolution steps, then the employee can request that the grievance be qualified for hearing. Now some grievances are qualified for hearing, other grievances may or may not continue on to hearing depending on how much evidence the employee can come forward with, um, depending on whether it, it warrants going forward to a hearing. Uh, one of three people can qualify the grievance for hearing, either the agency head or the director of the Department of Employee Relations counselors or the circuit court judge in the city or county where the employee works. If one of those three people qualifies the grievance for hearing, then DERC will appoint a hearing officer to hear the case. Now these hearing officers are experienced attorneys who have been practicing for at least five years and they've gone through the Supreme Court's certification process, which includes some training um, about the grievance procedure provided by the Department of Employee Relations Counselors. The Department of Employee Relations Counselors provides training on the grievance procedure. For management, we provide a course called Responding to Employee Grievances, which teaches you as a manager how to respond to a grievance and how it advances through the different steps of the procedure. Also for the employee, we have the grievance procedure and you, which is taught from the employee perspective of how to initiate a grievance and how to appeal the response through the different management steps. This tape is intended to pick up where those courses leave off, at that point when your grievance has been qualified for hearing and you're ready to go to a hearing. Now, I can't in this 40 or 50 minutes that we have here today teach you how to be a lawyer, but what I am hoping to do is give you some information as far as the mechanics of the hearing, a play-by-play -play of what to expect at the hearing to help you prepare for the hearing and so that you'll know what to do once you're at the hearing, you'll know what's expected of you and how to present your case. Um, now the grievance procedure only has a few very simple rules as far as how the hearing is supposed to be conducted. Much more simple than what you would have in a courtroom situation where there are a lot of rules, a lot of evidentiary rules, a lot of courtroom rules of, as far as how to proceed. The rules for the hearing are found in the grievance procedure on page 10 and 11 of the grievance procedure and I'd like to review those rules with you. Number one, opening and closing statements may be made by each party. Two, each party may be represented by an individual of choice, and that person does not have to be an attorney. And number three, in disciplinary actions, the agency presents its evidence first and must prove its case by a preponderance of the evidence. In all other actions, it's the employee who um, goes first and presents his or her case by a preponderance of the evidence. The formal rules of evidence do not apply. Non-party witnesses are not to be present in the hearing except to give testimony and be cross-examined. Exhibits offered may be received into evidence and made a part of the record. And of course, it'll be up to your hearing officer to determine what exhibits will be accepted into the record. The hearing must be recorded verbatim. A court reporter is not required, but if somebody wants to use a court reporter, they would be responsible for the costs. The hearing officer has the authority to determine the propriety of the attendance of all persons not having a direct involvement in the hearing, including witnesses and spectators. And the hearing should be closed to the public. Now those are just a few very simple, straightforward rules, but we at DERC feel like we can provide you with a lot more information to help you prepare and present your case. Um, I'm hoping, for example, to give you some information about a few legal terms, um, what to do if you encounter an, an objection, for example, if there's an attorney on the other side. Now what I won't be able to do for you is to give you the specific um, legal argument that you might make if you were in court, but then those don't, rules don't apply in the grievance hearing. But I'm hoping that you won't be caught off guard and you'll be able to bring the hearing back on track um, without losing your train of thought, without losing your composure. I'm going to be providing you with a lot of information today. You're not going to be required to do all of this. This isn't set in stone, but I want you to have as much information as possible, and then you can decide how much of it to use, how much time to take to present and prepare your case. 
it's much like being in school and preparing for a test or preparing a project. Sometimes you could spend a li very little bit of time preparing and do very well on your test or on your project. Other times you could prepare and study and research and not be completely satisfied with the outcome. But generally there's some correlation between the time you spend up front preparing and presenting the case and, um, and the outcome, especially if you have a strong case. We've got a lot of information to cover today, and all the information is found in your handout, and I encourage you to read the handout before hearing. Uh, but today I'll try to emphasize uh, the important points and try to illustrate some of those points with you. It's important to begin organizing your case as soon as you found out that it has been qualified for hearing. The reason for that is once a hearing officer has been appointed, he has got 30 days to hold the hearing and write his decision. So he's going to be contacting you pretty quickly for a pre-hearing conference. And you need to prepare for the pre-hearing conference by reading through all the documents carefully, any exhibits you think might be important in your case. And also start thinking about who you might want to use as witnesses. Make sure that they'll be available that when they're going to be in town or if they're going to be away for some time. You'll want to know that so you can take that into consideration when you schedule your hearing. Once the hearing officer is appointed, the first thing he'll do is try to schedule a pre-hearing conference. And the purpose of the pre-hearing conference is to simplify the issue, to try to go ahead and decide some procedural matters, get them taken care of and out of the way before the hearing begins, discuss settlement possibilities, and of course to establish a time, date, and place for the hearing. Now some hearing officers, as soon as they're appointed, will just automatically issue an order um, establishing a date for the parties to exchange witness lists, uh, copies of exhibits, and exhibit lists. Um, other hearing officers don't do that automatically, so you may want to take the time at the pre-hearing conference to ask the hearing officer to issue those orders. You'll also want to ask your hearing officer to issue an order for the appearance of witnesses. Now sometimes you might be inclined to just sort of trust your witnesses to show up if you ask them to show up. The problem with that is if something happens, if your witness has car trouble, gets lost, doesn't appear at the hearing, and then you ask the hearing officer for a continuance, he's going to wonder, well, if this person is so important that you can't go forward without them, why didn't you ask me to issue an order for the appearance of this witness? So you want to cover that base ahead of time by getting that order issued. Therefore, there won't be any question at the hearing. You can't go forward. Your witnesses aren't there. You need a continuance, or you need to stay the proceeding until you can find out where the witness is. Your preparation doesn't end after the pre-hearing conference. In fact, this is when your preparation begins in earnest. It's very important for you to get organized. Maybe you prepare a script for yourself or an outline of everything that you intend to say and to do during the hearing in the order that you plan to do it. One thing you'll want to do is to prepare your exhibits in some sort of an organized manner. There's no worse feeling than knowing that you brought a piece of paper with you or that you brought a memo with you and you're at the hearing and you can't find it and you're fumbling through your papers and you're fumbling through your briefcase trying to find this document. So that's why it's so important for you to organize the exhibits ahead of time so that you can lo locate what it is you're looking for quickly without breaking your train of thought. And there are a couple of different ways that you can do this. One is to prepare an exhibit notebook, a binder with all your um, documents, all your exhibits in it a tabbed notebook so that you can quickly flip to whatever it is that you're looking for at the moment that you need it. And it's important to do this not just for yourself but also for your hearing officer. When your witnesses are on the witness stand testifying, you want the hearing officer watching them, observing their demeanor, listening to them. You don't want the hearing officer to be distracted while he is looking for the memo that they're talking about. Um, he can go back and listen to the tape of the hearing afterwards, sure, but that tape is not going to have the same impact that the witness will have on the witness stand making co eye contact with the hearing officer and getting that rapport going with the hearing officer. Also, if the, if the hearing officer isn't paying attention while the witness is talking, he or she may lose the opportunity to ask a follow-up question or to ask a clarifying question. Again, if he's listening to the witness on tape after the hearing and realizes he needs more information, he's not going to have the opportunity to follow up with the witness. So you want the hearing officer to have that exhibit notebook so that he can follow along, quickly get whatever it is he's looking for, and still pay attention to what the witness is saying. You'll also want to meet with your witnesses before the hearing and prepare them so they know what to expect. I'm not saying put words in their mouth, but just talk to them about your grievance, 
what you expect from them, find out what information they have and how they can help you. In other words, you want to make sure that you're reading off the same sheet. Now, as you meet with your witness, you can get a feel for how good a public speaker this person is. Some people can just be asked a very open, broad question and tell their story in a narrative form in a very logical manner going from beginning, middle, end. Other people jump around, they may leave out important facts, and with those people you will need to lead them along a little bit more. So again, as you meet with your witness, try to figure out how you're going to ask the questions of this witness when you put them on the witness stand. On page three of your handout, we've listed some different forms of questioning for you, beginning with the very open-ended question. What did you see on July 4th? And then the witness can just tell the story. But if the witness needs a little bit more prompting, you'll want to narrow your question more and more. And the, the most narrow form of questioning is the leading question. This is a question that suggests an answer. Now in court, you wouldn't be allowed to do this. In a grievance hearing, those rules, those courtroom rules, don't apply. So it's okay to do this, but there are a lot of reasons why you're going to want to avoid this. If you're constantly asking your witness those leading questions, the stoplight was red, wasn't it? The driver had brown hair, didn't he? The driver ran through the red light, didn't he? The witness appears to be your puppet. They will say yes to anything you want them to say yes to, and the witness loses credibility. Another reason that the witness loses credibility is that it, can, it cre can create the appearance that you don't trust this person's recollection, you don't trust them to testify on their own, and you need to hold their hand throughout their testimony. If you don't trust your witness, why should your hearing officer trust the witness? So you've got to have a little bit of trust in the witness and give them a little bit of leeway um, to speak in narrative form. It's a balancing act and it's something you're going to have to figure out as you meet with the witness and discuss the case with them. There are a number of other things you need to review with your witness before the hearing. Remember, this might be the first time that they're testifying and you want to make them comfortable. Let them know that it's an informal process, very similar to what they would see in a courtroom, but must, much less formal, that you will be asking them some questions about what, what you've been talking about with them today, and that the other side will have the opportunity to ask them some questions, and that the hearing officer may also ask some questions about the matter that they testified on. Um, it's also important to advise your witness to listen very carefully to the question that's being asked and only answer the question that's being asked. Sometimes people think they know what the question is, but they're not sure, and they'll just try to answer based on what they think the question is. And the witness needs to know it's okay if you don't understand the question, just ask to have it repeated or rephrased and make sure you're, you understand what you're being asked. Another thing you'll want to review with your witnesses is what to do in case there's an objection. Now, while you're questioning your witness, the other side may object to a question you ask, or while your witnesses are being cross-examined, you may have some obje objection. If that happens, the witness needs to know that they should not get involved in the dispute about whether or not the question should be answered. The witness needs to know that they should just sit quietly and wait until the hearing officer decides on whether or not the question was appropriate. And then if the hearing officer overrules the objection, the witness can answer the question. If the hearing officer su sustains the objection, then the question will not be answered and, and you'll just move on to the next question. Finally, don't forget to let your witness know where and when the hearing will be held and make sure that they know how to get there. Give them directions if they need directions to the hearing. Now the hearing itself is broken into three main components. First the opening statements and then the po portion of the hearing where both sides present their evidence and finally the closing statements. The beginning of the presentation of your case will be your opening statement and many attorneys and judges will tell you that the opening statement is one of the most important if not the most important parts of your case. The reason is because it's your first impression. It's the first impression you'll make on the hearing officer. Now, you should tell your, uh, you should speak your opening statement as if you were telling a story, summarizing your grievance. Um, and it should have a logical beginning with some background information and a middle, middle and an end. And it should make sense. If the hearing officer can follow along with you during the opening statement, if you make a very good first impression, then he'll be able to stay with you throughout the hearing and follow along with everything you told him would happen at the hearing. You've got to lay it out like a road map for him. If, however, your opening statement doesn't make sense, 
if you jump around too much, if you don't have a theme or a point that you stick with, then it's going to be an uphill battle from there. He's going to have a very hard time following you throughout the case. I think of the opening statement as the picture on the box top of a puzzle. It's kind of like a puzzle with all, all the evidence and all the exhibits and all your witnesses are like pieces of the puzzle and you're explaining this to the hearing officer. Now if all you do is throw those pieces out at him at your, in your opening statement and throughout the hearing, then he's, he's going to have a hard time figuring out how to put these puzzle pieces together. And these puzzle pieces can fit together in a number of different ways. If you don't explain to him very clearly what the end picture is going to be, then he is going to go back to his office after the hearing and try to put those puzzle pieces together himself. And he may end up with a number of different shapes. And these may or may not be the picture that you're trying to paint for him. These may or may not represent your theme, your story, and your case. What you want to do during your opening statement is give him the complete picture so that he can follow along with you throughout the hearing. Mr. Hearing Officer, our case today is a story about a tree with a number of leaves and branches. It's very clear to him. He literally sees how the pieces fit together and he'll be able to follow along with you during the hearing process. We've listed several elements of an opening statement for you on page 7 in your outline, and, and I want to emphasize just a couple of those for you. One important element is, that people tend to overlook is take the sting out of weaknesses in your case. If you know your opponent is going to bring out a weakness in your case, then go ahead, bring it out, and do it in the best light possible. Otherwise, it's going to appear to the hearing officer that you're trying to hide this. An example of this might be a nurse in a mental health hospital who is charged with some documenting errors in the patient's medication charts. Now the nurse's defense is going to be, well, the patient was not harmed. From the agency perspective, though, that really doesn't matter. If there are medication errors, that could pose some liability for the hospital. It could raise some licensing concerns. The hospital's position is going to be, we can't wait till a patient is harmed. The hospital might also want to emphasize, listen, our patients are s under severe mental incapacities. They can't tell us whether or not they're in any pain. They can't tell us whether or not they've received the medication. So it's especially important for us to keep accurate charts and accurate logs of all the medication that the patients receive and when they receive them. Take the sting out. Yes, nobody was harmed, but that doesn't mean that discipline isn't warranted under these circumstances. What we have for you now is a videotape of a mock opening, our opening statement. The opening statement will be made by Greg Lusick. What we've asked Greg to do for us today is we've given him a set of facts and we've asked him to argue the case as he would if he were representing the agency. And then to turn around emphasizing different points, emphasizing some inconsistency in the facts, and argue the case as he would if he were representing the grievant in this grievance hearing. And I think you'll find that he does a very effective job of doing so. Um, you might want to follow along with the elements on page seven and eight of, I'm sorry, on page seven of the outline um, and see how many of these points he hits. And I think you'll find that he hits several of these points. Good morning, Mr. Vaughn. My name is Gregory Lusick, and I represent the employer in this case, the Hometown University Police Department. The grievant is Bart Gunning. He was a patrolman with the Hometown University Police Department, and his job was to protect and serve the students and faculty at Hometown University. He was terminated for committing a Group 3 offense in violation of Hometown University Police Department policy. The policy prohibits, first, engaging in criminal conduct either on or off the job, uh, or second, engaging in conduct on or off the job that undermines the effectiveness of the police department activities, including acts of behavior which might impair the department's reputation. We will show you in this hearing that Bart Gunning was terminated for actions which occurred on August 1st, 1996, after he went off duty. He went to a bar, Ronnie's Rack and Brew, which is right across from the campus, and he went with a friend, Hunter Wilcox. At that bar, he drank beer, pitchers of beer until 1 o'clock in the morning. We will show you that while Gunning was getting himself into an inebriated state, a scuffle broke out between Wilcox, Gunning's drinking buddy, uh, and a student at the university, a Mr. Cal Dudman. You will learn that Gunning was specifically trained in quelling disturbances of this type involving students. 
You are taught to remain calm. You identify yourself as a police officer. You show your badge. You take other proper steps to avoid confrontation. But Gunning took none of those steps. Instead, he physically attacked Mr. Dudeman. He viciously punched and assaulted him. Mr. Dudeman was a student, the very person Gunning was sworn to protect and defend as a police officer for the hometown university campus police. The evidence will show you further that the hometown city police arrived on the scene and Gunning still did not let up his assault on Mr. Dudeman. Indeed, he was so possessed with violence that the city police had to use pepper spray on Gunning to stop his attack. This violent assault on this hometown university student was only part of Gunning's abuse of authority. The evidence will show you that Dudeman, Wilcox, and the other participants uh, were criminally charged with assault and battery and drunk and disorderly, but not Gunning. We will show you that Gunning took advantage of his position as a police officer to secure a professional courtesy from the city police. Even though Gunning was guilty of the same crimes as Wilcox and Dudeman, he was not charged. Again, it was a misuse and abuse of his authority as a police officer. You will hear testimony from, Cap from Lieutenant Bridges, who is the Community Affairs Director for Hometown University Police. She will explain to you that this type of favorable treatment for a police officer hurts law enforcement. It hurts the efforts of law enforcement and it dirties the reputation of the very police who are charged with the responsibility of enforcing the law. You will also hear from Captain Wicker, who was Gunning's supervisor. He will explain that a police department is a paramilitary organization with an unwavering need for adherence to the highest standards of conduct from its officers. Police are given an enormous amount of authority, and you will hear Captain Wicker tell you this. They are heavily armed, they are given a badge, and they are given the power to arrest and detain people like you and me. Captain Wicker's job is to ensure that his officers do not abuse their authority, and he is obliged to take appropriate actions when they do. The evidence will show you that's exactly what he did in this case. And finally, Captain Wicker will testify that this is not the first time Gunning has abused his authority. At the time of his termination, he had an active written notice for the same violation of policy when he used his badge, his gun, and threats of arrest to gain admission for himself and his date to a backstage party at a concert on campus. This was another outrageous abuse of his power. In sum, while Bart Gunning may be capable of doing many things, he does not have the temperament to be a police officer. He is a hothead and he abuses and misuses his authority. Captain Wicker's decision to terminate Mr. Gunning was based upon substantial evidence and sound policy and has been upheld at every stage of review. We ask you now to sustain his termination. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Vaughn. My name is Greg Lusick and I, rep I represent Bart Gunning who for seven years served as a patrolman for the Hometown University Police Department. Now, I agree with the employer's counsel that this case involves an abuse of authority, but it was Captain Wicker who abused his authority when he fired Bart Gunning because Patrolman Gunning was attempting to do his job. He was trying to break up a fight in a bar that involved students from the campus of Hometown University. He was doing his job. He put his own safety at risk. He did not shy away from his duties, and yet his thanks was this termination. And we will prove to you that Officer Gunning was just doing his job that night. You will hear from Hunter Wilcox, who was an eyewitness at the scene. He will tell you that Cal Dudeman, a student at Hometown University, started this fight at the bar when he threw food at Wilcox. Dudeman was the aggressor. He attacked Wilcox, and Officer Gunning intervened solely to try to break off this fight. You will hear from Gunning himself that he was trying simply to do his job as a law enforcement officer that Dudeman was struggling, resisting, and was difficult to restrain. Officer Gunning had a difficult job to do, but he did not shy away from his job. Even the city police officers who came to the scene, Patrolman Good and Patrolman Sweet, cannot tell you that Gunning's actions were improper. Indeed, they will testify that they may have aggravated this situation. They used pepper spray, pepper spray on the struggling men and as they will tell you, pepper spray is known to agitate people instead of subduing them. In fact, there is only one witness, one witness, who might say that Officer Gunning was the aggressor, and that is Cal Dudeman, the student who started this fight. But we will show you that Dudeman is not credible. 
He bears a grudge and he has a bias against Officer Gunning because Gunning was the patrolman, the campus patrolman, who gave Dudeman a speeding ticket just shortly before this incident occurred. And again, Gunning was just doing his job. Now, uh, my opponent makes an issue uh, of the fact that the city police officers did not arrest Gunning. They say he took advantage of his position. But how do you arrest someone when all the witnesses, except one, state that this officer was trying to break up a fight, that he was, in fact, trying to do his job? It would have been a mistake for these officers to arrest Patrolman Gunning or to charge him with anything. They recognized that, and that's why he was not charged. Now let's turn to the hometown university police department policies that are at issue in this case. The first policy that the officer is alleged to have violated was criminal conduct. But again, it's not a crime to do your job, especially when your job requires you to get in there and break up a fight. Can you terminate someone for criminal conduct when they have not been arrested and there is no fine? No, you cannot. And that would be an abuse of authority to do so. The, the second policy that Mr. Gunning is charged to have violated is engaging in conduct which undermines the effectiveness of the police department or which might impair the department's reputation. Well, what kind of vague standard is this? What kind of standard allows you to be fired for just doing your job? What kind of breadth of interpretation allows you to be fired for performing your duties? Think of that when you listen to the evidence. And think about it, and this is especially important, because when you look at the earlier written notice that Captain Wicker gave Patrolman Gunning, it's based upon this same vague and ambiguous policy. Now, Mr. Vaughn, the employer has the burden of showing by the preponderance of the evidence that the employee committed a group offense. They cannot meet that burden with the evidence you will hear today. But even if you should find that there has been some violation of the standards of conduct here, we submit that termination is much too harsh. Officer Gunning has been a patrolman for seven years. He has never been subject to discipline for anything relating to his activities on duty. For seven years, every working day, he has gotten up, put on his uniform, and placed his life on the line in service to the people and students at Hometown University. Bart Gunning is the victim here today, and he is a victim of injustice. Mr. Vaughn, you have the power to correct that injustice and we ask you to do so here today. Thank you. Now, as you can see from Greg's tape, he had two different themes going. On behalf of the agency, he was arguing, we had this off-duty police officer, he got drunk, he got in a bar brawl, and then he weaseled his way out of an arrest by flashing his badge, and that makes the department look bad. On the other hand, from the grievance perspective, he said, hey, Officer Gunning is the good guy. He was off duty, and yet he, he entered into this and tried to break up and quell the dispute. It's going to be up to the hearing officer to decide, in this case, which witnesses are most credible, which ones had the best vantage point, whose memory and whose perception he's going to rely on in making the decision about which version of the facts he believes is the true and accurate version of the facts. And that's going to be his role. That's, it's his job to make that decision. A couple of other things, I, and a couple of other comments I want to make about Greg's opening statements. You notice that he referred to the hearing officer by name, Mr. Vaughn, Mr. Vaughn, the evidence will show this, the witness, witnesses will testify to that. It's very important to establish that rapport with the hearing officer. You want him to trust you and to believe you, and one way of doing that is by establishing that back and forth rapport with him by calling him by name recognizing the fact that he is there and he is your or she is your decision maker. Another important point that I want to make is that your opening statement is not evidence. You should not testify during your opening statement and if you start to testify during your opening statement about what you heard or what you saw or what you think the hearing officer is probably going to rein you back in and remind you that your opening statement is merely a summary of what the evidence will show. So try to refrain from testifying during your opening statement. Also, remember that the opening statement is not evidence. It's your summary of the evidence. And if you say something during your opening statement, you should be prepared to prove that during your case, either through your witnesses or through your other exhibits. Um, if you don't 
prove something during your case that you said during your opening statement, your opponent is going to call you on that and remind the hearing officer, hey, he said this during his opening statement, where was that witness, where was that testimony, and it's going to make you look bad. So make sure that you're prepared to present evidence on all the points you make during your opening statements. What I'd like to do now is jump ahead for a moment to page 13 in your handout and discuss evidence in general, and then I'll come back and talk about your, the witnesses a little bit more specifically. Now remember, at the hearing, you will want to prove your case by a preponderance of the evidence. What that means basically is that more likely than not, your version of the facts is correct. Your side is the most convincing side. And that doesn't necessarily mean the, the most evidence. That means the most credible evidence, the most reliable evidence, the most believable evidence. Now, what should you use as evidence? You can use pretty much anything you want as long as it's relevant and helps to prove a point in your case. For example, if you have a map, you can use a map showing somebody's region or somebody's route that they use in work if it's something related to your case, or perhaps a room diagram to help the hearing officer visualize what happened on the day in question. If you have a videotape or an audio cassette, it's possible that he may allow you to introduce those as evidence as well. You can use documentary evidence, for example, memos, copies of departmental or state policy, sign-in sheets or sign-in logs that show when people arrived at work or, or what they were assigned to do that day. Any of this information can be helpful to the hearing officer, and if it's relevant to, to the case, he may allow you to introduce that as evidence. And of course, let's not forget the importance of witness testimony as well. Now, some of you may have heard the term hearsay. Now, if you were in court, generally hearsay wouldn't be allowed. And what we mean by hearsay is somebody testifying and repeating what somebody else said, heard, or saw outside of the courtroom. Like I said a second ago, in, in a trial or in a court proceeding, that won't be allowed unless it falls into one of a number of um, exceptions to the hearsay rule. During a grievance hearing, we don't have those evidentiary rules, so the hearsay would be allowed, but it's still important for you to keep in mind, am I presenting hearsay evidence, or can, is there some way I can get the evidence of the actual eyewitness on the witness stand? And there are a number of reasons for that. If, for example, an investigator is testifying at a grievance hearing, he may be testifying very honestly and be telling the truth, but all he can do is repeat what other people have told him or, or present a summary of what the investigation revealed to him. But the people at the hearing are not, are, um, not able to judge the credibility of the people who actually made the statement. First of all, the people that made the statements to the investigator may not have been under oath at the time and probably were not under oath at the time. Another reason why hearsay isn't considered um, very reliable is that often when information is repeated from one person to another, it gets changed, it gets embellished. Um, for example, in the game we played as children at birthday parties when something was repeated from person to person to person and by the time it gets to the last person in the room, it may be very different from the original statement that was made. Finally, if we don't have the actual eyewitness on the witness stand, the hearing officer is not able to judge the credibility of the actual eyewitness. Is this person biased? Were they really paying attention to what happened, or were, was their view obstructed? Were they talking on the phone? Um, do they have a reliable memory, or does their memory tend to waver a little bit? It's important for the hearing officer to be able to judge that, and if what you have is secondhand information, he's not going to be in a good position to judge the credibility of the actual eyewitnesses. I'm going to move back now to page 8 of your outline and talk a little bit more um, specifically about your witness testimony, your direct examination of witnesses. Now, of course, direct examination is when you ask your witnesses questions on the witness stand, who, what, where, when, how, why, how many, all the facts related to your grievance. It's also your opportunity to educate your hearing officer. He doesn't work at your facility, he doesn't work at your agency, and you can use your witness to educate your hearing officer not only on matters of what does the policy say, but uh, why is this policy there and how is it interpreted? What's our mission statement? What's our statutory duty? And how does the policy further that obligation? 
Um, what are the special needs of our clients and how does the policy further the, those special needs of our clients? It's very important for your hearing officer to have that substantive information and not just have the actual words of the policy because you're going to want to have a real understanding of, of what your job is and what your office or your agency does so he can make the right decision when he, when he analyzes the facts and plugs them into the policy. Something else I want to warn you about. Lots of times your witnesses will want to take their files up to the witness stand with them. And I'd strongly advise you against allowing them to do that. The reason is if you've got a good attorney or a good representative on the other side and your witnesses takes paper up to the wit paper up to the witness stand with him or her, then your opponent is going to want to see what's in that file. And more likely than not, the hearing officer is going to decide that they may have a right to see what's in that file. Um, at a minimum, the hearing officer will want to review the file itself to see if it's something that should be released to the other side. Now remember, the hearing officer does have the authority to order the release of documents. And if he thinks it's appropriate, anything that goes up to that witness stand with your witness might be released to the other side. So you're really taking a chance there. There may be some notes in the file, things that the witness intended to look into but never looked into, or just some mental processes that may or may not be relevant to the final decision that was made or, or to, to what occurred or to the facts or just doodling or embarrassing information. I, I'll never forget one time I was at a hearing and my witness, without even thinking about it, inadvertently reached into his pocket, pulled out a note, read the note during his testimony, put it back in his pocket. And of course the attorney for the other side immediately jumped up and said, what's that? I want to see that. And the poor witness just said, it's, it's a shopping list. It's just some stuff my wife wanted me to pick up on my way home from work. Well, what happened in that case was the hearing officer looked at the note and said, it's not relevant to the case, it's just a few things he's going to pick up from the grocery store, you don't need to see it, gave it back to the witness. Now I don't know what was on that note, it may have been some embarrassing stuff that he really didn't want the hearing officer to know about, but in any case, stuff like that can happen and you risk stuff like that happening um, when a witness takes paper up to the stand with him or her. Um, and it can be some damaging stuff that can be used to cross-examine your witness. So try to keep your witness away from doing that. Have extra copies of exhibits ready. They can refer to the exhibits. Another alternative might be for you to say, listen, give me the file. If you need to look at something, let me know. I'll find it and I will give it to you. Third option, if the witness absolutely will not let go of that file, take a look at it, see what's in there, and be prepared to deal with what's ever whatever is found in there. Now we talked earlier about what to do as far as preparing your witness in case of an objection. And of course, you also need to be prepared to deal with an objection. If there is an objection either to a question you ask your witness or to some other exhibit that you want to put into evidence, the hearing officer um, generally doesn't just automatically make a decision. He'll give both sides the opportunity to tell him why they think it should or should not be allowed. A couple of things you can do if, if you want the evidence to come in. Remind the hearing officer, of course, that the rules of evidence do not apply in these grievance hearings because lots of times the objections you'll get, especially if there's an attorney on the other side, will be evidentiary or courtroom rules that don't apply in the grievance process. So remind them that these rules do not apply. And by the way, you can say very firmly, the rules of evidence do not apply. What I've seen people do more than once is say, oh, but I thought those rules didn't work here. Well, that's not very convincing. The grievance procedure very clearly says that the rules of evidence don't apply. So you can, you can say with the utmost confidence the rules of evidence don't apply. If you're not an attorney, you can remind him that you're not an attorney and you're not prepared to deal with the legal arguments. However, you can also remind the hearing officer that he is directed by statute and by the grievance procedure to receive probative evidence. And what we mean by probative, probative evidence is that it tends to prove or disprove a fact that's involved in your case. Also by statute, he's only authorized to exclude evidence, evidence that's irrelevant, immaterial, insubstantial, privileged, or repetitive. The statute doesn't give him the authority to exclude evidence for other reasons, so you can remind him of that. Um, in summary, let him know this is why the element the evidence is relevant to my case and also let them know this is why it's reliable evidence and evidence that you should consider in making your decision. 
Of course, if the objection is overruled, then the witness will be allowed to answer the question. If it's sustained, then the witness will not be allowed to answer the question. You move on to the next question. Once you've asked your witness questions, the other side will have the opportunity to ask your witness some additional questions to, to try to discredit your witness. This is, of course, what's known as cross-examination. Likewise, when the other side presents its evidence and puts its witnesses on the witness stand, you'll have a chance to cross-examine their witnesses. Now, the purpose of cross-examination is, of course, to discredit the witness's testimony in some ways, or, or in some way. And we've listed some of the purposes of cross-examination on page 11 of your handout. Of course, you can discredit the witness by raising some doubts about the witness's credibility, raising doubts about the witness's perception or memory, showing the absence of facts to support your witness's case. In other words, did the witness leave out some facts that they knew about but conveniently didn't mention? Or was the witness unaware of some of the facts when they reached their conclusion or made their decision? You can bring that out during cross-examination. Something else you can do during cross-examination, which is very important but is not listed, and I encourage you to write it down in your notes, is, of course, witness bias. If the witness is biased in some way, that could influence their memory, that could influence their word choice as they testify. Um, so you'd want the hearing officer to be aware of it if the witness was, was biased in favor of one side or another. Now, uh, we've listed some additional principles um, connected to cross-examination on page 12 of your handout. And something I want to emphasize for you is um, number eight. Don't ask the one question too many. When you're cross-examining a witness, stick to the facts. If you ask your witness to draw some conclusion or to render an opinion, chances are that witness, even though they may testify truthfully on the facts, might not agree with you on, um, on, the, on the conclusion to be reached or what inferences can be drawn from those facts. And, and I'd like to show you an example of, of what I mean. Um, if you want to remember back to Greg's opening statement, the example with Officer Gunning, and was this, was this a brawl? Was Officer Gunning involved in a brawl? Was he throwing punches? Or was he trying to, to break up the fight and pull people away? Now, that's going to be a factual issue in that case, and you're probably going to have some differing testimony on what actually happened that day. And let's suppose that there was another officer present that day. Um, officer Amatuli was present that day. And you, in your preparation of the case, read through Officer Amatuli's statement to the Internal Affairs Investigation. So you're pretty confident about what the facts are and what uh, Officer Amatuli had to say about what happened that day. Now, Officer Amatuli, you were Officer Gunning's partner when he was a, a rookie with the police department, were you not? Yes. And you've remained very close friends with him over the years. Isn't that true? Yes. Well, I've read through your report to the Internal Affairs Investigation, and I understand that you were there the night of this incident at the bar. Isn't that correct? Yes, I was. Um, and from what I saw in your report, um, it was a typical college, college campus bar right near the campus. A lot of students were there that night because it was right after final exams. Right. And there was a very popular band playing that night. It was very crowded. Isn't that right? Right. And I understand there, were, there was a lot of drinking and a lot of smoking and a lot of noise and a lot of people milling around. Yeah, the that usual. The usual. And um, then this fight started and the crowd gathered to see what was going on. And you also went to the scene to see what was going on. Isn't that true? Yes. A lot of people trying to get in and see what's happening because people are curious whenever a fight breaks out. Isn't right. that true? Right. Well, Officer Amatuli, let me ask you this question. Isn't, isn't it possible that during all this confusion and, and all this and the police coming in and the band playing and all these people drinking and smoking and this fight breaks out, isn't it possible that at some point you might have turned your head away and during that minute when you were distracted, Officer Gunning threw a couple of punches, got a few good knocks in? Oh, no, I saw everything. You see what happened here is I asked that one question too many. Now, Officer Amatuli is going to be very honest. She's not going to lie. She's going to explain the facts and what happened to be very honest about that. But she's not going to admit the possibility that she could have made a mistake. Also, she's not going to do anything that could um, hurt her friend's case by saying, oh, I could have looked away for just a minute. Now, in reality, we all know that, that that's a reasonable inference, that with all this confusion, it's possible that she could have just looked away. 
but she's not going to admit that during my cross-examination of her, or at least it's not very likely that she's going to admit it, and I'm taking a big risk if I ask her that question. All I need to do is elicit the facts from her and then stop right there. During my closing argument, we'll be talking about closing statements in a minute, but during the closing statements, I can remind the officer, the hearing officer, about what happened here, remind him that Officer Amatuli is a friend, remind him of the confusion in the bar, and remind him that, hey, when something like that happens, it's, it's very possible that somebody could look away for just a second. Officer Amatuli didn't see Officer Gunning hit anybody. I've got a witness that did see Officer Gunning hit somebody. Not that she's lying, just that she could have missed something, and my witness happened to see it. Now, something that often happens during cross-examination is uh, when your witnesses are being cross-examined, that is, is, they may be asked a yes or no question. And sometimes those yes or no questions need a little bit of explanation. The answer may be yes, but, or no, but. When your witnesses are being cross-examined, cross your opponent probably is not going to give your witness the opportunity to provide that explanation. Or they may be asked a question out of context that, that needs to be put back in context to explain, to clarify the statement. Your opportunity to do that will come during your redirect. In other words, after your witnesses have been cross-examined, you can come back and ask them some additional clarifying questions on um, redirect. You don't need to do it every time, just if there's those statements that need to be explained and need to be put in context. Now let me ask you a question. Um, suppose in the case of hypothetically an agency uh, presenting a disciplinary action and the agency presents its case and then the grievant takes the witness stand and all of a sudden the grievant comes up with this new um, explanation of why he or she couldn't have been the person who stole the office equipment. Oh, it wasn't me because I was working somewhere outside of the office on the day that the equipment was missing. This is the first time that the grievant has, has made this statement. Now, during the agency's presentation of the case, they didn't do a very good job of proving that the grievant was actually at the office on that very day when the equipment was missing. What happens? Are they stuck? No. Um, the agency will be given the opportunity for rebuttal if they can bring in some additional witnesses saying, we saw the grievant there that day or some logs, sign-in sheets, whatever, showing, yes, he was at the office that day. He was, in fact, at the office that day. Um, now, sometimes what may happen during rebuttal is, like I said, some new information may, may come out, and you need to somehow rebut it. Um, and perhaps you don't have the evidence you need with you because this is not something you anticipated. You've been caught by surprise. What you can do in that case is ask the hearing officer to hold the record open. Let him know you have some rebuttal evidence, another witness, um, some stuff you can check in your computer log, whatever, um, and that if you hold the record open and continue and come back on another day, you'd like to present your rebuttal. It'll be up to him to decide whether or not to allow you to do that, but, but that is something that he can allow you to do. You're also going to be better off if you're up front at the time of the hearing, before the hearing's over, and ask him to hold the record open at that time than you would be if you wait until after the hearing and then after the hearing come back and ask him to reopen. He's probably not going to be as inclined to allow you to do that if, if the hearing's already ended and everybody's walked away. So keep that in mind. If you think you may need some rebuttal but you want to go back and double check some things at the office, ask that the record be kept open so that you can do that. The next phase of the grievance hearing will be the closing statements. Now the purpose of the closing statement is to bring all the elements of your case together in a simple, understandable way that shows why your position should be accepted by the hearing officer. In other words, it's a summary of your case. Very similar to the opening statement, but rather than telling the hearing officer what the evidence will be, you're reminding him of all the evidence that he's heard and seen at the hearing. We've listed some elements and tips for you on page 16 of your handout, and I want to emphasize a couple of those tips for you. Um, of course, remember we talked earlier about if you have circumstantial evidence, 
um, you'll want to remind your hearing officer during the closing statements of what inferences he can reach or what conclusions he can reach based on the facts that you presented. Um, emphasize all the important points of your case and of course point out the weaknesses in your opponent's case. If your opponent said something during the opening statement and didn't come forward with evidence on that point, you can remind the hearing officer of that. Um, something that it's important for you to do, not only dur during your closing statement, but al also throughout the hearing, is not to be abusive or show any personal animosity towards your opponent. Just stick to the facts, just stick to the evidence, just stick to whatever policy is involved. But if you spend the whole hearing or spend your closing statement rolling your eyes at things that the opponent said or that your opponent's witness said, oh, 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 you know, that does not present a pretty picture for the hearing officer and that doesn't win any brownie points for you. If you're representing the agency, all that shows him is that you don't treat your employees with respect. If, if you are the grievant, all it shows is that you don't respect authority and that you don't respect your supervisors. But it's not evidence, it doesn't help you prove your case, it just let, makes you look bad. So remember to act professionally, not only during the closing statement, but throughout the hearing. There's no need to call anybody a liar or, or for any name calling, just remind them of the facts of the case. At that point, the hearing will end, but you may have the opportunity to challenge the hearing officer um, or his decision um, after the hearing. These challenges or administrative reviews of hearing decisions must be made in writing, and they must be received by the reviewer within 15 calendar days of the date of the original decision. Copies of these requests for review must be sent to the other party and to the director of the Department of Employment Dispute Resolution. There are three types of requests for administrative review. Requests for the hearing officer to reconsider the decision or reopen the hearing are made to the hearing officer and they are gen generally based on allegations of incorrect legal conclusions or newly discovered evidence. The second type of challenge is a request for the director of the Department of Human Resource Management to determine whether the hearing decision is consistent with policy. These challenges must refer to a particular policy mandate. Finally, a challenge that the hearing decision does not comply with the grievance procedure is filed with the director of the Department of Employment Dispute Resolution. The hearing officer's decision becomes final when the 15 calendar day time period has expired and neither party has filed a request for review or when all requests for review have been decided and, if ordered by EDR or DHRM, the hearing officer has issued, issued a revised decision. Either party can also seek review of the final hearing officer's decision by the circuit court on the basis that the decision is contrary to law. The agency must first request and receive EDR's approval filing, prior to filing a Notice of Appeal. The Notice of Appeal must be filed in the circuit court of the city or county where the grievance arose, and it must be filed within 30 calendar days of the final hearing decision. The circuit court's decision can also be appealed to the Virginia Court of Appeals. If a party fails to implement or follow the hearing officer's decision, then the other side may petition the circuit court in the locality where the grievance arose and ask the judge for an order requiring implementation of the hearing officer's decision. The petitioning party must provide a copy of the petition to the director of the Department of Employment Dispute Resolution and to the other party. This concludes today's presentation. I wish you good luck in your grievance hearing. If you have any questions or need additional information, please contact me or the Virginia Department of Employment Dispute Resolution at 1-888-23-ADVICE.